FM2 News begins now. It's been a busy news week in Spokane and the rest of the Inland Northwest. Thank you for joining us here on Krem2 Plus for Week in Review. I'm Tim Pham. Here now is a look at some of the biggest news stories from this past week. Well, Mayor Woodward says the city has been incredibly patient, but after months of discussions with WashDOT, they have still not been provided an end date. And with last week's explosion at the camp, which injured two people, Woodward says it's time to take the next step. This February, a federal judge said the city and county could not clear the camp unless a Spokane judge declared the property a chronic nuisance and issued a warrant of abatement, which is exactly what the city is now asking for. It's not good for the school that's a block away. It's not good for the neighborhood. It's not good for the businesses. It's not good for the people in that encampment. It's not safe and we need to have it closed. The complaint says the state has failed to stop the drug and criminal activity that is quote robbing the neighborhood of their peace and quiet enjoyment. Well, I don't see the benefit in any way to removing them at this moment. They're on the path to getting other options. They are all participating and inside this fence they are structured monitors. There's rules and services offered when they go into the community. That's a lot harder to provide. In a statement, the Washington Department of Transportation said it's continuing to reduce and ultimately close the camp and that forcing people out now would simply continue the cycle of shuffling homeless people from one location to the next without addressing its root causes. Julie Garcia of Jules Helping Hand says the 60 plus people who remain have the most needs. These folks, we have data, we've collected needs assessments on everybody here, and we can show and prove that these folks don't fit into any of the solutions that we currently have. Well, we have a navigation center that can address all of those needs with wraparound services for all of those things that you just mentioned. So we have a place for them and leaving them where they are, it's not working out. So this Thursday, Washdot's expected to go before a judge and defend themselves and explain why this abatement order should not be considered. Reporting in Spokane, Kyle Simchuk, Crim2 News. Washdot says it's making progress in shrinking Camp Hope and moving campers into jobs and housing. And that's one of the reasons the timing of the lawsuit is puzzling. The encampment along I-90 is down to 65 people as of last week an 86% decrease since October's count of 465. But the city wants Camp Hope closed immediately, asking a county judge to let them clear it. Yeah, it was a, a bit of a surprise because what we have been asked for is progress, and that's what we continue to show each and every week down here. The city's lawsuit calls Camp Hope dangerous, accusing the state of failing to stop drug and criminal activity. How can they be so sure that all of the crime within the area is actually associated to Camp Hope? We have a significant number of people that actually try to get in. Ryan Overton with WashDOT questions the timing since Camp Hope is continuing to shrink. And now we've got the Cannon Street shelter, which is closing at the end of May and Track is nearly full. You know, there's still 65 individuals here at camp. If they come in and remove all those individuals, where are they going to go? Overton says the state and its partners have worked to not only relocate campers into housing, but they're providing job training and other resources on site. Not just push people around to other locations throughout the city, but actually solve the root cause of homelessness. He fears closing camp before that work is done could push the homelessness problem and the people back into the streets. Just let us close it at this point. That's been our goal all along is to permanently close Camp Hope. WashDOT will present its argument against the abatement tomorrow afternoon. Shannon Mowdy, Crem2 News. The city of Spokane told the judge it wants the state of Washington to provide a plan on how it's going to close the homeless encampment near I-90, along with a time frame on when this will be accomplished. The judge's ruling today put the city one step closer to getting just that. Attorney Lyndon Smithson argued on behalf of the city of Spokane. We are extremely concerned, Judge, that the state has no plan, no idea when they're going to close this encampment and how much longer it's going to be. But the state argued it's been working tirelessly to transition people living at the encampment into long-term housing. There is good, solid progress that's continuing to move forward. 
And the state continues to work with these individuals on site. Those remaining are some of the most acute that have issues with um, meeting their activities of daily living. The nearly two hour long hearing concluded with a few different rulings. The judge declared the encampment a chronic nuisance, reserved authorizing a warrant of abatement for the city to clear the camp, and denied the state's request to terminate the city's temporary restraining order. Which means service providers at the camp can continue offering services, but if they see any drug use or drug paraphernalia, they must call police. and law enforcement must respond. The judge also ordered the city and state to present a plan to clear the encampment by April 19th. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. By May 19th, there will be no planned deliveries at Bonner General Hospital. That's already having an impact on expectant parents. It doesn't matter if it's your first time or seventh they're here. <laughs> it doesn't take long, you know, and it's a matter of in Leandra Wright's case. being in tune with yourself too and being able to time it right. I, I may, what if I, what if I don't notice in time and, you know, it, it's a huge stress. I don't know. I don't know. I just hope we make it. She's not nervous about giving birth to a baby boy in August. It's just. I had a baby December of 2020. This is my, yeah, it would have been my second here. It won't happen at the hospital she's become comfortable with. Bonner General is shuttering its labor and delivery services, citing less doctors, less patients, and Idaho politics. Idaho has some of the strictest abortion laws in the country. The hospital says some nationally recognized standards of care now threaten to criminalize physicians under Idaho's laws. For right. So I'll have to finish my last trimester appointments down in. The politics don't matter much. Coeur d'Alene, I assume. Um, I just called and talked to them today about it because I wasn't sure how that was going to go. Like other patients, she'll need to transfer care to Kootenai County Health about 48 minutes away. It's nerve wracking. It's stressful. And my stomach kind of just dropped. Like now I have to reestablish with another place and I have to drive to have my baby. I did reach out to Bonner General Hospital to get some more answers about this seemingly sudden decision. And that is one of the things that we want to know. How was the decision reached? What was the process like and how long did it take? What was the main factor in shuttering the department? And I was actually told that the hospital is overwhelmed with the number of people asking questions like this, including the national media, and that a spokesperson would get back to me. So far, though, I haven't heard back. Shannon Mowdy, Krem 2 News. We all know the feeling when you find money in your pocket you never knew you had. So it's kind of fun to kind of convince people, hey, you know, this is not a scam. This is money that's owed to you. And, you know, they're they're really surprised. And Joe Geisler's agency may have your money waiting to be claimed. Any money that maybe a business may have owed you and they could not get it to you. It's called Unclaimed Property, a legitimate agency whose purpose is to protect you, the consumer. After one to three years, a business or government entity has to send the money to the Department of Revenue to hold until it's matched to the consumer. How much money are we talking about? Are these small sums of money or are these large sums of money? Well, we currently hold about $1.8 billion uh, in unclaimed property wow. that we're looking for the rightful owner. Um, the average claim amount is about $131, um, but, you know, that includes, you know, we have some claims that are over a million dollars, and then we have, you know, claims that are, you know, $5. I tracked down a Spokane family to see how much money they could get back from the state. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Tim, how are you? Not until last week. But when Krem 2 walked them through the process, they learned each had money waiting to be claimed. I definitely was surprised, and then I was really surprised to see who, 
who the money was coming from. Jeff had $400 waiting to be claimed from his former employer and a medical bill he overpaid. So where does unclaimed cash come from? It could be a closed bank account, uncashed checks, or rebates to name a few. Basically, any money that a business could owe you can become unclaimed property. Otherwise, if it stays with the business, they may never know that they had that money. So here's how you find out if you have unclaimed property. Go to claimyourcash.org, type in your name to search for property, then select your property and click claim. How much money did each of you receive? Close to $1,000 with the family, so it was certainly worth our time, that's for sure. I feel like they should just send it to people, right? It's our money in our name. They should, you know, send a postcard and just say... Uh, you know, is this you? And if so, you know, send this and then boom, you're good. Why is it that folks have to reach out to you? If you have people's information, why not just reach out to them? A lot of this property, it, it requires documentation. So, you know, we, we would like a, a signed claim form, a copy of uh, photo ID, those kind of things. But, you know, there and, you know, people's names change, people move. Um, so it is, it's not the easiest thing in the world to, you know, just refund money to people because it does take a lot of work. Uploading documentation is simple. That is, if you can track it down. One of Kathy's claims is from 2002. If she can't provide proof, she's at least glad to know the rest of her family is getting some of their money back. Well, one of them said, is this a scam? Um, and then, uh, and then kind of joked about it, like, well, 105 bucks, do I really, you know, am I really gonna do this? But yeah, I absolutely am. Now, what do you guys think you're gonna do with your newfound riches? <laughs> mm, probably retire. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I don't know, maybe uh, go out to dinner or something. It's, it's a nice little hit and uh, happy to get it. Since this story began airing, thousands of you have texted in. Because of our reporting, we've helped return $13,000. And this is just what you've shared with me this past week. So be sure to email me and let me know how much money you are getting back. My email is there on the screen. It's tfam at creme.com. In the studio, I'm Tim Pham, Krem 2 News. That mom is now facing a very serious criminal charge. She was arrested and taken to jail. The one-year-old child was taken to the hospital just to be checked out. Court documents show that at least one witness told police that this was no accident. It was intentional. According to a search warrant obtained by CREM2, a Spokane police officer was flagged down outside this 7-Eleven last night by a concerned citizen who said a woman was smoking from what he described as a meth pipe and blowing that smoke directly into the baby's face at least two times. The officer reported seeing 35-year-old Candace Lewis put the glass pipe into the cup holder of the stroller and walk into the store, according to court documents. Police received multiple 911 calls about the incident. Krem 2 reached out to one witness who shot this video, which reportedly shows Lewis standing outside the 7-Eleven with a baby stroller. The witness, who asked to remain anonymous, said Lewis stopped blowing smoke into the stroller once she realized people were watching and when this video was recorded. Now, police interviewed Lewis, who denied using drugs or blowing smoke into the child's face. According to court docs, police learned a similar incident was reported earlier in the day, just two blocks from the gas station. Another witness said a group of people were smoking fentanyl with a baby present. That one-year-old was taken to Sacred Heart to be evaluated. CPS is now involved with the case. Lewis was expected to make her first court appearance this afternoon. She's currently in the Spokane County Jail. Reporting in downtown Spokane tonight, Kyle Simchuk, Krim 2 News. In June of 2020, Carrie Wiltzius went on an early morning bike ride here on State Route 206 when she was struck by a tow truck. She was flung from her bike off to the side of the road. She died a few days later due to brain injuries from the incident. The driver of that tow truck, Jonathan Reiser, is now on trial for vehicular homicide. This is the second week of the trial, and today we heard from another cyclist who says he was nearly run off the road by the same driver just before the fatal incident. Swerved close to me about two or three feet. I gave it, I gave it a fist. <laughs> And then it continued and I continued. And then I don't know how far it is, quarter mile, if that. I saw a bunch of commotion in the road. 
some people running from one house, a car stopped, and then a mangled bike on the road, someone lying in a ditch. That someone was Carrie Wiltzius. She was a wife, mom, and grandmother who loved being involved in the Spokane community. She was our cheerleader. Her three daughters, Cara, Dawn, and Katie, say they were always inspired by her tenacity to keep moving. In fact, Carrie spent the last nine years competing in triathlons after seeing Dawn finish one. She saw women in their 90s doing, doing the triathlons, and, you know, she... She felt like uh, it was something that she could do. All three of her daughters have sat in court for the suspect's trial. Every day, they wear these necklaces Katie had made in honor of their mom. I wanted a way to carry her with me. And so these are azaleas um, and hummingbirds was always our thing. They will wear these mementos throughout the trial, keeping Carrie close to their hearts. Attorneys are expected to give their closing arguments tomorrow. Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News. The jury started deliberations late this afternoon after hearing from Jonathan Reiser himself about his version of that collision. Jonathan Reiser was one of the last witnesses called in his vehicular homicide trial. Pretty much at the last minute, kind of like, you know, cutting for me somewhat. And, uh, you know, struck the, you know, we struck, I mean, I, I mean, it happened pretty quick. He's accused of hitting and killing Carrie Wiltzis with a tow truck in June 2020. Reiser admitted he smoked marijuana the night before and took a pill hours before that collision. Just to pick me up, you know, I had anticipating uh, Fridays for me was, were really, really busy, so I just, uh, for a little energy. He admitted he'd bought it from another driver and assumed it was an illegal drug. Prosecutors say Riser had meth in his system and he acted recklessly that morning. Is it the decision of a rational, sober person that with oncoming traffic coming at some distance and this being a solid yellow line that says I should not pass, that I'm going to go ahead and make this passing decision? And we all know how that worked out. It resulted in Ms. Wilchis's death. But his defense attorney says under Washington law, just taking meth and driving isn't enough to convict him, and that Reiser passed field sobriety tests after the crash. So they have to prove that it is, it is impaired the person's driving. It impaired the individual's ability to operate a motor vehicle. That's the legal threshold that you have to make. The jury got the case around four this afternoon, so the earliest we can expect a verdict is Wednesday. Shannon Mowdy, Crem 2 News. A Spokane County jury found a Post Falls man guilty of killing a cyclist he hit with his tow truck three years ago. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jonathan D. Reiser, guilty of the crime of vehicular homicide as charged. The jury reached the verdict for the vehicular homicide trial this afternoon, after only a few hours of deliberations. In June of 2020, Jonathan Reiser struck a cyclist on State Route 206 near Green Bluff. The woman he hit died a few days later due to brain injuries suffered from the incident. The cyclist's family shared a sigh of relief when the judge read the guilty verdict. Finally, just wishing mom could be here. There's like, our minds can focus on other stuff now. We can start like processing a little more, grieving a little more. Riser was not in custody during the trial, but following the conviction, he will now be in the Spokane County Jail until his sentencing on April 28th. According to prosecutors, Riser could face as much as nine years in prison. This May, voters in Coeur d'Alene will be asked to pass a two-year, $25 million supplemental levy. If it fails, the district says cuts will be deep. And in the end, it's 311 employees. I'm not on a renewable contract, and so I'm really probably up on that list, and so it is scary to think what's going to happen. Julia Smolkowski is a seventh grade math teacher. She's also worried about her students. No levy means no school sports or extracurricular activities. Two elementary schools would close. Watching kids um, come into my classroom being like, 
what's going to happen to my sports? What's going to happen to bands? Like so many of our kids love their extracurriculars and that's why they're at school. The children should not be involved in any of this. Teachers are involving them in the classroom and making the kids feel bad and go home and say, we're not going to field trips anymore, we're not going to have this anymore. Amy McCalmy opposes the levy and doesn't think it's fair the district gets a second chance to pass one. They're using the children right now as pawns of, oh, you're not going to be able to play sports next year. They had the band out here playing earlier of, this is going to get cut. And it's like, really, are those things going to get cut? I'm sure there's other things that could get cut. We are now cut down to the bone. There is no fat. By eliminating the maintenance levy and limiting the supplemental levy to two years, board members hope this proposal will be more appealing. There's been the impact of lack of trust. There's the impact of misinformation. Um, there's the lack of, of some of us just coming together and moving forward together to support um, each other. The May 16th election just eight weeks away. In Coeur d'Alene, Kyle Simchuk, Krem 2 News. The Idaho Transportation Department is anticipating traffic volumes on I-90 to double by the year 2045. To get ahead of that anticipated growth, the department wants to work through solutions with the community now. North Idaho is preparing to hear more of this and this on I-90. The Idaho Transportation Department expects traffic demands to increase over the next two decades. Double on I-90 by 2045. The department is doing a study on solutions to handle the projected growth. Megan John says one focus of the highway study is the 15th Street interchange in Coeur d'Alene. Looking at the growth and the expected increase in cars that will use this interchange, we need to make some changes in particular to the ramps to make it safe. John says this area sees a lot of demand and will only get more congested in its current design. Our traffic modeling shows that the more cars that are using this in the future, it will take more time to get off the freeway to get onto 15th Street. In the meantime, those cars will stack up or queue or back up onto the I-90, which you don't want to see stop cars in the middle of a freeway. Tuesday, the department hosted an open house to talk about the interchange and get community feedback. We were showing people how the ramps would be changed and how that could impact their commute. John says the study is still in its design phases. She says I-90 could look different depending on available funding. You could see additional lanes and you could also see new interchange types or other collector distributor roads depending on how the study evolves. The department says it will host another open house to continue conversations with the community later this summer. Summer. If you weren't able to make the open house earlier this week but still have thoughts on the 15th Street interchange, the department has a feedback survey open through April 4th. You can access the link to that survey on our website, creme.com. In Coeur d'Alene, Janelle Finch, Krem 2 News. Tonight, council members once again heard desperate pleas from people who live in the neighborhoods which are right next to where this development will go in. They're really concerned about the high density and the thousands of cars that this project will bring in the future. Developers say Corterre will be built in phases over multiple decades. They have volunteered to build a police substation, several parks and trails, and have set aside land for two new schools. Now plans include building a maximum 2,800 housing units at various price levels. 5% of housing will be dedicated to workforce housing. Council members Gookin and Wood voted against the proposal. They feel it negatively impacts the surrounding area. We, I don't think we're protecting that neighborhood. In fact, we're sending a message to every single neighborhood in this town that your neighborhood is at risk because this council will bend to new development. I'm not sending that message, Dan. We are sending a message to every neighborhood in this town that your neighborhood is at risk if a developer comes in next door who wants to build something big and flashy for all the talking points you've heard. That is the message. Other council members said they heard neighbors loud and clear and understand their concerns, but that those need to be weighed against the needs of the community now and in the future. They say the city has a housing shortage and needs more affordable housing. Reporting in Coeur d'Alene tonight, Kyle Simchuk, Krem 2 News. The South Hill Library celebrated its reopening today, and after more than a year of renovations, it now features a new play space, study spaces, and computers. The South Hill Library is back, and so are the books. 
but there's more. South Hill Library, we've got a lot of new things to look forward to, including Turkey Treetops Children's Play Space, um, two new study rooms, four study pods, and updated amenities like carpet, lighting, shelving, all of this coming together to really make a 21st century library experience. That's Alina Murkar, the communications manager for Spokane Public Library. We are so excited. All of this has been, I mean, as you can imagine, five years since the bond was passed to renovate all these libraries, so it's really been a long time coming. In its grand opening, the library saw more than 100 people. Now, parents like Elizabeth Shaw and her two sons can enjoy what the library has to offer. Whoa. With the children and just making sure that they had a place where they could focus all of their energy, but it's just incredible. You can go in here and you Shaw can... Shaw only lives a block away, so she's glad she can... Walk to the South Hill Library, put the kids in the strollers, and um, it's special that it's ours. It's a place to create new memories and make new friends. The spot that you go to feel connected, especially when you're a new parent and you maybe don't have as many friends or going to story time is an opportunity to make friends for the kids. A story time event is already scheduled for Wednesday morning for children ages three to five. So this library is open seven days a week and there's also a self-directed checkout for you to do at any time. In Spokane, Nathan Hyun, Krem2 News. On the busy streets of downtown Spokane, you expect to hear the commotion of the city. But three years ago, it all went silent when the state went into lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not normal to go into like a busy place, park your car somewhere in the middle of the street and just walk around like it's yours. This became James Kennedy's playground. I got these places to myself. The last time he stood at this corner, Spokane looked like a ghost town. I think I put my camera right here, put it on my timer, then walked right into the street and did the whole thing. Dude, this is like 6 o'clock in the afternoon where things like should have been completely, you know, full of traffic and people. There was something about it where I had to drive that point home. It was just like, I am the only one here. He wandered over to Riverfront Park. Basically from here over there was empty. Then pointed his lens down Monroe Street Bridge. Like why wouldn't you go out in the middle of a bridge that was completely empty? As a photographer, that's like gold. But the streets aren't empty anymore. And the difference is night and day. There's no way I'm going out there now, but it was cool at the time. James returns to his once empty playground, relieved to hear the commotion again. The place is vibrant. I mean, people are walking around. It doesn't look like there was a nuclear blast that went along here or anything like that. It's a different playground now. It tells me that we made it, we got through. But it's the kind of playground this photographer is happy to see. Amanda Rowley, Krem2 News. So I actually just ran into somebody last night when I was out shopping who came up to me out of the blue and said, oh my gosh, I love your account. We have so much fun following you. Erin Peterson and Melissa Berry are the women behind Trending Northwest and Everyday Spokane, two immensely popular social media accounts that cover all things Inland Northwest. I first started uh, Everyday Spokane, which was actually my Instagram and website. When I moved back to Spokane in 2018, I started my Instagram account just to kind of share our move up here, what it was like to travel with our dog, what it was like to find an apartment and start to house hunt and everything. And as we were exploring Spokane and I was re-exploring Spokane, my husband and I kept following this one Instagram influencer who had these amazing food recommendations. And so I reached out to her and her name was Erin got together for coffee and I mean the rest as they say is history. It kind of came about because it just happened. I actually started being a food and travel writer and I loved getting to share about all the delicious foods that were available here in Spokane and throughout the region. In addition to food, they cover everything trending in the Northwest from stylish spas I think my favorite right now that I just wish everyone knew about is Salish Lodge. They have one of the most gorgeous spas that you've ever seen. To wine recommendations. Another hidden gem that's in our region that I don't think a lot of people think of as much is Tri-Cities. And um, one of my favorite wineries there is Purple Star. To people trying to make a difference in our region.
we're trying to cover people who we find interesting, people that we think of our friends. What would our friends like to know about our region? We saw something missing in the media landscape in our region, and we really wanted to showcase diverse voices and make sure that we had an inclusive publication that everyone could see themselves in. So no matter what walk of life they come from, what income level they have, or what their cultural background is, we wanted them to feel empowered and uplifted and encouraged by the content that they read. Thank you for joining us here on Krem 2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories in the past week in Spokane and the rest of the Inland Northwest. For the most up-to-date news throughout the weekend, you can watch our very latest newscast right here on Krem 2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.